All right, so let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's going to be a very interesting week. So I want to give a fairly basic introduction, hopefully slow, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions later. There's some relatively new ideas that are starting to filter through into quantum field theory in different contexts, some of which overlap interests of people here at this meeting. There are some reviews. A lot of this work has been done with uh, Meta Tunsal. We've written a few reviews. And there was a KTP program last semester in Santa Barbara. So there are a lot of talks and uh, some tutorial talks online if you want to have a look at those also. Let's start with some motivation. There are a number of big problems in non perturbative physics in quantum field theory. One of the goals here is very ambitious to try and give some constructive, I won't use the word rigorous, some constructive definition of non trivial quantum field theories in the continuum, not just on the lattice. Part of this involves the concept of analytic continuation of path integrals. I'll talk a lot about that as we go along. Some of the associated motivation, we've already heard about the sign problem, density, field theories, not just in particle physics, it's a big problem in quantum chemistry, condensed matter physics, been known to mathematicians for a very long time. Another application that's closely related would be to dynamical real-time evolution on path integrals, non-equilibrium physics. I'll touch a little bit on that. Also, just to learn some extra things, new things about perturbation theory. It's hard to believe we can still learn new things about perturbation theory, but we seem to be doing so. Getting some new understanding to strong weak coupling dualities, how to extrapolate from one region where we can calculate to some other region where it's more difficult to calculate, and vice versa. And then some more specific questions that I'll mention as we go along, the infrared renormalon problem, and what to make of non-BPS saddle solutions that exist, and they're somewhat mysterious from the physics point of view until you look at them through the eye of the surgeon. And a more mathematical question is how to do improved resummations when you only have access to some piece of information not the whole series or not some uh, integral representation. So I don't really need to say much about this to this audience, but of course, UCD phase diagram is a big open problem. Many aspects of it we understand better and better, but details about this end region and crossing these lines, we still have a lot of trouble doing real calculations. And as you all know, this is due to the sign problem coming from the determinant factor. There are also related problems in condensed matter physics related to how to understand phase transitions in the path integral formalism. Another one that's already been mentioned is that equilibrium thermodynamics, of course, is just tailor-made for um, the Euclidean path integral. But when we go to non-equilibrium processes, not equilibrium physics, we really have to deal with the Minkowski path integral because of the schwinger keldish time contour formalism. Is this working? It sounds to me as though it's fading in and out. Okay. 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 And this is related to being able to do quantum trend problems in strongly coupled systems. Again, not just in particle physics, but in atomic physics, condensed matter physics. So these, the sign problem and this non-equilibrium physics problem are two really serious problems in theoretical physics. And any new insight, I think, is valuable. So let's just begin with something really simple. This is what physics is, the path integral with an I, adding up phases. And this is what's usually calculated. And how do you go from one to the other? So the formal wick rotation, of course, is fine in certain circumstances, but not always. So here's the sort of poster chart of this problem, the airy function. Here's the integral representation of the airy function. Think of it like this. 
Here's a plot of the area function. This is it oscillating on one side when the parameter x is negative. But when the parameter x is positive, it decays exponentially. This integrand here, when x is large, and not terribly large, here's a plot of the real part of that integrand when x is 5. So it's oscillating like crazy. There's absolutely no way you can do that integral. Okay, there are massive can cancellations that occur in this integrand. So the area function of plus 5 is 10 to the minus 4. You have to somehow add up all of those areas and get an answer that's 10 to the minus 4. Okay. So to do this integral via Monte Carlo is just absurd. Okay. Simply impossible. Do that integral by any sort of Riemann sum is also practically impossible. We all know the resolution to this problem. We've all done this a million times. We deform this contour of this integral into the complex plane onto steepest descent paths. On the steepest descent paths, the integral is perfectly well defined. It's completely smooth and localized. There's no oscillatory behavior whatsoever. And you can simply do now do the integral on the steepest descent contour any way you like. Monte Carlo, Riemann sum, whatever. Okay? The surprise is, is, as you vary this parameter x from positive to negative, so remember x is a parameter in the integral, it's not the integration variable. As you vary that parameter, change its phase from positive to negative, the saddle point contribution to this integral changes rather dramatically. When x is positive, the behavior is governed by one saddle point. When x is negative, it's governed by two saddle points. Okay? There's e to the plus i and e to the minus i on this side, and there's just e to the minus on this side. Okay? Again, everyone knows the details of this, and I'll go through it later this morning in the context of resurgence. But this was the original problem. So I just want to make a fairly simple statement that if for ordinary integrals, basically the only way we have to understand these exponential integrals at all phases of parameters, so think of that parameter x as a chemical potential or temperature or something like that, you might be interested in calculating that as you vary the phase of that parameter. If for an ordinary integral, the only way to handle it numerically and computationally is via contour deformation, it at least begs the question to understand whether that's a meaningful question for path integrals. So I would say it's an obvious idea, but can we make it work? That's some physics background to maybe motivate the ideas I'm going to talk about in these lectures. But there's also some mathematical motivation that may be less familiar to people. So this funny word resurgence, I'll explain in a minute where this funny word comes from. But it's a relatively new idea in mathematics, on the time scale of mathematics. So the, the name was coined by Jean Eccal in 1980. But really, the birth of this idea came from Stokes in exactly the problem I just discussed. Stokes was trying to understand the area function for applications in optics. And he was trying to come to terms with the question of why there was a contribution from one saddle point when x was positive, but by two saddle points when x was negative. He struggled with this question, came up with a brilliant answer to it. This is now, in the spirit of the name resurgence, being reborn in this formalism developed by Carl and collaborators called resurgence. For a physicist, I think one way to define it, I'll give about three or four definitions of resurgence during these lectures, but the, I think the starting point for us, it's a way to unify perturbation theory and non-perturbative physics. I have to tell you what I mean by that. Let's just recap a few basic points, perturbation theory generally gives divergent series. It's just the way it is. Okay, there can be some special cases where perturbation theory truncates or converges, 
but these are always due to some extremely special tunings of parameters and special symmetries. The generic behavior is that perturbation theory is divergent. Perturbation theory is built on a series expansion in some small parameter. The first step in resurgence is to replace that series expansion by something a little bit more general called a trend series, which I'll define on the next slide. And the whole point of a trend series is that a trend series is supposed to be well-defined under analytic continuation. In contrast to a series, which only gives you information about the expansion along some particular line in the complex plane in that parameter, not about how to generalize that series as you analytically continue. So that's the motivation of defining a trend series. And the amazing thing is that it can be done. But as soon as you do that, you learn that perturbative contributions and non-perturbative contributions get mixed together, which at first sight you may think is a bad thing because it complicates things, but actually it's a very good thing because it means that you can use non-perturbative information to learn about perturbative information and vice versa, provided you understand the structure. So this idea was developed by mathematicians, so they have been busy working through all the differential equations you can think of. So it's very, very well understood now in ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, both linear and nonlinear. In differential difference equations also, linear and nonlinear. It's been applied in fluid mechanics, in quantum mechanics, and now there have been developments applying it to matrix models, field theories, string theory, seems to be extremely general and quite powerful. There's also another point I'd like to mention is that we often teach and we often learn non-perturbative physics as some sort of approximation, some sort of rough approximation, some Gaussian approximation to some integral or something we're trying to calculate. The idea of resurgence is that in principle, you can do much better than that. And the difficult part of that sentence is, in principle, can you do it in practice? So in, in cases where you have some concrete, well-defined differential equation, you certainly can do much better. Whether you can do it in a complicated quantum field theory, that's a, still an open question. So what I'll talk about, I, I learned this morning that I'm giving two lectures today, so we'll just give some introductory stuff in the first lecture, go through some examples, then I'll talk about some applications in quantum mechanics and field theory in the second one, and then the third lecture I want to talk about mixing perturbation theory with large N through some matrix models and some supersymmetric quantum field. So let's begin with trans series. So Hardy's book on divergent series makes an interesting cryptic comment, well, many interesting cryptic comments, but here's one of them. He's basically saying that he's never seen a problem that couldn't be solved in terms of exponentials and logarithms. Okay? And Hardy's definition of he hasn't seen a problem means they don't exist if he hasn't seen it. So this was, comment was sort of left hanging until about 1980, Jean-Éric Carle made this very profound claim that has since been rigorously proved that, in fact, this is really all we need. So that's the summary of the theorem. The, the theorem takes several hundred pages to even state and discuss, but I'll give you a, the gist of the argument. It's interesting that this came from the realm of dynamical systems, so called nonlinear differential equations. Why are there exponentially small um, problems in these chaotic differential equations? At the very same time, completely independently in mathematical logic, mathematicians realized that there was a closed logical system called trans series. These people had nothing to do with each other, but they came up with a very similar formalism. So here's the basic idea. A Carl statement was, actually, let me go back one. So consider the following problem, abstract mathematical problem. Is there a set of functions that's closed under all mathematical operations? Okay, so let's start. Let's start with Taylor series. 
Okay, you can add and subtract and do all sorts of things with Taylor series. Suppose you allow for dividing. Okay, now, now you're stuck because now you develop Laurent series, inverse powers. Okay, so suppose, suppose you now want to integrate. Well, now you've just generated logarithms. Now suppose you invert the logarithm and now integrate. Now you have a divergent series. So you're out of your set very quickly. And if you follow this line of reasoning for maybe five minutes, you might think that this is just going to spiral out of control and just be completely unsolvable. Turns out it's not. There is a closed set of functions closed under all mathematical operations. And the set of functions are those built out of three what are called transmonomial elements, powers of some parameter, exponentials of minus one over that parameter, and logarithms of that parameter. Right? So I'm talking of a function of one variable for now. Okay? Plus iterations of these. So I have to allow for true closure, I have to allow for exponentials of exponentials of exponentials and logs of logs of logs of logs. Okay? The claim is that that set of functions so generated is closed under all mathematical operations. So in particular, what's of interest to us is that it'll be closed under operations that we're interested in for doing perturbation theory and controlling divergent series Namely, Borel transforms, analytic continuation, and inverse Borel transforms. You notice that, of course, these are independent of one another functionally because I can't expand this in powers of this, and I can't expand this in powers of this, and vice versa. Okay? Now, I'm not even going to begin to give a proof that, of this closure. It's not what I'm interested in. It's probably not what you're interested in. The interesting thing from physics is that we recognize each of these. And we recognize this baby trans series here, where I haven't included, included iterations, just powers of the various elements. We recognize this as perturbative fluctuations. We recognize this as instanton fluctuations. And we recognize this as the logarithms that are generated when you take into account interactions between the instantons and anti-instantons. So we know these guys, and if you put these together, this is what we call multi-instanton calculus in field theory. So then we come back to say, well, okay, is this just a relabeling of something we already know? And the point is that there's extra information coming from this resurgence perspective. We learn new things. First of all, this trans series by definition now can encode the analytic continuation properties of the function we're trying to uh, define. I'll give you, not a proof, but I'll give you some examples of how this works. It also means that these coefficients, which now see they depend on three indices, think of these as the perturbative direction, the instanton direction, and the zero mode direction. These coefficients are necessarily correlated in the different directions, meaning if you have information about, say, the perturbative sector, you can learn something about the other sectors and vice versa. They're not independent directions. And that's extremely powerful, actually, that statement. And if you're interested in getting extreme precision, you can get exponentially improved asymptotics. And I'll talk about some examples from some applications in matrix models and field theory where you can get extreme precision. Notice here that the sum that I've written here over the powers of logarithms is cut off related to the number of instantons. That's because it comes from the instanton instanton interactions. You need at least two of them before you see this. Okay. So those are trans series. These are the basic building blocks. Now, what is, where does this word resurgence come from? The basic idea to keep in mind is imagine you have some problem that you're trying to solve in terms of some parameter. And there are some special points with that parameter. They may be fixed points, they may be singularities, they may be saddle points, they may be whatever, they're distinguished points. 
The idea is what you can do as a physicist is usually to make an expansion around those special points. Maybe high temperature, low temperature, weak coupling, strong coupling, some singular point, some boundary point, things like that. So the basic idea is that in principle, the fluctuations around these distinguished points are related to one another. And in extreme situations, if you know all the information about the fluctuations around this point, the idea of resurgence is that the function so probed here will resurge at the other singular points, meaning the information about the fluctuations at these other points should somehow be encoded in the fluctuations around another point. So to the mathematicians, the definition or the, the goal of resurgence is how do you do complex analysis? I mean, real complex analysis, not real, genuine complex analysis. <laughs> right, global complex analysis, monodromy, all this fancy stuff. How do you do that with divergent functions? We all know how to do that with nice meromorphic functions and with branch points. We all learned that. But how do you do it when the, thing, the objects you're working with are actually presented to you as divergent series. Is that possible? And resurgence is the answer to that question, actually. It doesn't matter because the whole point is I can take G squared to be every, yeah. Yes. I'll show you explicit examples in just a minute. Okay. But first, let's just recap some, make sure we're grounded in physics before we get started on this fancy mathematics. So perturbation theory is generically divergent. Think of just simple quantum mechanics problems, calculating the ground state energy as a series in the, some coupling strength. Here's a list of classic problems. Zeeman effect, Stark effect, cubic oscillator, quartic oscillator, periodic potential, double well. In all these cases, the coefficients grow factorially fast. What's interesting is sometimes they're alternating in sign and sometimes they're not alternating in sign. We'll understand that more deeply in a second. Sometimes it's n factorial, sometimes it's 2n factorial. We have to understand why that's happening. That's, there's a physics answer to that. And we have to understand why it's sometimes n plus a half factorial and sometimes it's just n factorial. Okay? There's a physics answer to that also. But you notice just by this sampling that there's really generic factorial growth in the coefficients of uh, perturbation theory. Same thing in field theory. But we all know it works despite that. And works, again, I don't need to give this an audience like this, but you know, absurd precision in the g minus 2 for the electron, which has now been calculated out to fifth order in alpha. There are roughly 13,000 five loop Feynman diagrams went into that calculation. So there are only three, you know, two digits of precision there. Absolutely heroic calculation. Take the most precise value, independent value of alpha from experiment, insert it into here, and that's what you get. Take the most precise current measurement of G minus two, which has nothing to do with alpha, measured independent of alpha, and that's what you get. Okay. So that's pretty convincing that QED perturbation theory works, at least for some things. And in QCD, we know because of asymptotic freedom in some regime, perturbation theory also works very well. So I've learned in giving some lectures that physicists somehow are a little bit not always completely confident of what an asymptotic series is, so let me do some real very basic things here just to show you by example. You've got some series expanded around some point, so this is the coupling, the distance from your expansion point. You take some finite number of terms plus a remainder, and the difference between a convergent series and an asymptotic series is for a convergent series, the remainder always goes to zero as you take more and more terms in the finite sum, keeping x fixed within the region of convergence. 
An asymptotic series, on the other hand, this remainder term goes to zero as x approaches the point, but with n fixed. Okay? Two different ways of taking the limit. The implication is that in a convergent series, if you want to get a more precise answer, a smaller remainder, smaller error, you just calculate more terms. With an asymptotic series, it's not like that. There's a concept of optimal truncation where the number of terms you should calculate is related to how big the parameter is. So again, let's do some examples to understand it. So here's the classic example studied by Euler. You take the series where the coefficients are n factorial. And let's take the one where they're alternating in sign. So this is actually just the asymptotic expansion at small x of the exponential integral function. So this is a function about which we know everything. We know all its analytic continuations, so this is a good guide to discuss because we can do everything. But this is its asymptotic expansion if you just went to small x along the positive line. And so here, as a function of the truncation of this series, here are the values you get. The red line is this function evaluated at point one, and here at point two. And you see that, remember, it's alternating. You alternate, oscillate around the actual value, and then beyond a certain point, it, goes, it gets bigger and bigger again. Same here, oscillates, and then gets bigger and bigger. So the idea here, there's a concept of optimal truncation, that the optimal order at which to truncate is when this quantity here is minimal. So that means that when you truncate it at some point, capital N, the value of x is related to the value of n. So in particular, if this is growing factorially, this is a nice exercise I recommend. It'll take you 30 seconds using Stirling's formula. Find the minimal point, minimal value of that, and you'll discover that the optimal value of n is roughly 1 over x. And you see here that the rough optimal order is roughly 10. Here, it's roughly 5. Okay. Beyond that, the truncations will diverge from the actual answer. Now, if you try the non-alternating guy, this is one of the other, this is just e1 at minus 1 over x. Similar behavior. Now, it's not oscillating around the actual value, it's just going like this. But you see again, it's actually at 9. It, the rule is it's actually 1 over x. You step back 1. The largest value minus 1. Here you see it's about 9. Here you see it's about 4. Okay? So this is completely generic. I've given you two examples, but this is a generic behavior for an asymptotic series. And it means in practice that if you go back to QED, where we presume the expansion parameter is alpha over pi, that's a very small number, so we should be good for several hundred orders in, in perturbation theory. <laughs> but we're up to five. <laughs> but it should tell you that in QCD, things are very different. <laughs> so contrast this with the behavior in a convergence series where it just gets better and better, as long as you're within the radius of convergence. Another comment is that when you do this truncation, the error that you make in the truncation is the remainder term, which in, a, in an asymptotic series is bounded by the last term, the guy you threw away. But the guy you threw away is just n factorial x to the n in magnitude. So you think it's a power law error that you made. But it's not, because x is related to 1 over n. Right? The order of truncation is related to x. So actually, the error looks like this, which is exponentially small in n and exponentially small in x. So actually, there's a very real sense in which Asymptotic series are much more precise than convergent series. An asymptotic series is very often a much better approximation than having a convergent series. If you want to test that, pick your favorite Bessel function and try to evaluate it at some intermediate value. And I assure you that the asymptotic series is much better than the convergent series. Okay, so there are many ways that have been developed to study divergent series. 
the one that seems to be best suited for this story of complex analysis and resurgence is the so-called Borel summation technique. Again, physicists use this a lot. Let me just give my version of the story. So here's the simplified version. The more precise version will come in a little bit. So imagine we're confronted with this thing again. The sloppy way to introduce Borel summation is to write n factorial in this integral representation, insert that into this formula, bravely interchange integration and summation. Then you're just integrating over a geometric series. The n just appears here now. So we're just summing minus 1 to the n, x to the n, t to the n. And that's just this integrand. And the point is that this integral is perfectly well defined for all positive x, or x with a real positive part. So the idea is to define this to be the Borel sum of that. The more precise way to say it is that given that integral, the real positive x, if somebody were to ask you what's an asymptotic expansion of that integral for x positive, you would write down this. Okay. The problem is that very often in physics we're presented with this, not with this. Okay. Now, there's a whole vast literature, hundreds of books written about under what circumstances this question mark can be removed and when you can do this. There are theorems about when you can do it. Unfortunately, in most physics applications, these theorems are somewhat limited of use because there's a lot of fine print that we often don't know. In quantum field theory, do we know all the global analytic properties of some structure function that we're calculating? No. We know some things, but not enough. So very often in physics, Borel summation is exploratory. So here's how it works in this situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm declaring that this sum is the, uh, sorry, this integral is the Borel sum of that uh, divergent series. This red line as a function of x is just this function, or in other words, this integral. And the dashed line is truncations of this asymptotic series. And so you see that at very small x, they all go to the correct value of 1. But as you increase the order of truncation, they get better and better at small x, but worse and worse at large x. Okay. So in other words, with an asymptotic expansion, you have to understand what you're doing. You can't just truncate at two orders because you got tired, right? or because there are too many diagrams. You have to correlate the point at which you truncate with the size of the variable that you're interested in. Now, it gets much more interesting and physically more interesting if it's a non-alternating series. So formally speaking, if I just change, get rid of the minus 1 to the n, I've just changed the sign of x. Right? So I could just take this expression and change the sign of x. If I follow the same formal steps, that's what's happened. But you notice now that we acquire a second question mark because there's another problem now, that on the contour of integration, there's a pole at t equals 1 over x. So what do we do about that pole? If you're just presented with this, you may not know what to do about that pole. But anything you do with that pole will generate a contribution which is imaginary, which is non-perturbative. The pole is at t equals 1 over x, so you'll get a term that's e to the minus 1 over x. It's imaginary. You're not quite sure whether you should put a half in front of that or not, or whether it's plus i or minus i. Okay? So there are some problems here, and we have to really understand what's going on. It's also rather weird, because every single term in that series is real and positive when x is positive. And now I'm telling you that the sum of that series has a contribution which is exponentially small and imaginary. So we should understand what that means. So here, let's just check it with this example. <clears throat> this guy has a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is the principal part of this integral. So you go up to the pole, 
You go to the pole from either direction, take the limit, that's the principal part, that's real. And that should be the real part of this function. So the red line is the real part of that function. The dashed line underneath it is this principal part integral. And they coincide perfectly. You'll notice that if you just took this sum here, it just goes like that. You can never make that sum turn over. Okay? Because you're just adding higher powers of x with factorial. So it's just going to keep going up like that. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that this function, this exponential integral function, we happen to know something about its analytic continuation properties. It satisfies a differential equation. It has integral representations. We can study all of its um, analytic properties. And it has this so-called connection formula that if you rotate the argument, change it by minus 1, it's actually related to this EIN function, which is entire. It's completely regular everywhere in the complex plane. But there's a logarithm, and there's a minus or plus i pi, depending on whether you rotate it this way or this way. Yeah? No, it's e to the minus 1 over This is evaluated at plus x. Is it minus x? So that you see that there's this additional plus or minus i pi times this, which is exactly what the Borel prescription picked out. So in fact, if you do Borel summation consistently, and this is what resurgence will teach us how to do. We actually, from the series, reprocessed through this Borel machinery, recover this non-perturbative contribution, which is necessary to build the correct analytic structure of this function that we're trying to describe. Okay, so that's the basic plot. The question is, can we do this in a real problem? Not just in some simple differential so, so what, sorry, what is the statement of the assumption? Of, I mean, if you have a convergent <coughs> series, then you know in that region of convergence, it's analytic and you do analytic continuation. What is the statement that you are imposing to say that you have an analytic extension at all? The statement is that, so I don't want to get into statements of theorems, all right? It's just not the, not the right venue. We can talk about it later. So Burrell, the Burrell, um, procedure has some theorems about when you can do this. It's related to the rate of growth of the coefficients. The point here, the only point I want to make at this point is that if you follow that prescription from a series given to you just along some particular direction in the complex plane, it's possible to reconstruct a function for which you can now analytically continue. Okay. I'm going to give you a couple more examples, really simple examples where you see explicitly how this works. But I don't want to be stating theorems. I, I blocked them out from my slides. So. So let, let me get slowly a little bit more precise. Given a divergent series, these coefficients are not always just n factorial. But the leading growth is n factorial and then subleading corrections to that. So we have to be a little bit more precise. So the basic idea is, given this series, we define what's called its Borel transform, which is you write down a series in a new variable, the Borel transform variable t, and you change the coefficients by dividing them by n factorial. And if you got it wrong, if you should have divided by 2n factorial instead of n factorial, you will soon learn that you should have divided by 2n factorial. So this new series typically has a finite radius of convergence. And then the Borel sum of this original series is just this integral of this function. So you see that if, if you can simply interchange summation and integration, then doing this t integral just generates an n factorial, which cancels the n factorial that you put there, and so you're back to the original series. Okay? But the procedure now is that given this series, you define a function, and the analytic properties of that function are going to tell you how to analytically continue. So then the question is, how much information do I need about these coefficients 
to know the analytic structure of that function. Okay? So we've, we've shifted the question from the series to the Borel transform function. But the, the physics question still remains. How much information do you need? And that we'll get to. So the point is now, this function can have singularities. It can have poles, it can have branch cuts, it can have all, all sorts of things. You have, might have multiple sheets. How do you control that? So if you just have a, a singular point that's a pole or a branch cut, one obvious thing is you can just deform your contour so you go just above it. So if this is a pole, the difference between going above and below is just the contribution from a pole, which is some exponentially small term. Okay, so think of it as a physicist, you're picking up a non-perturbative contribution from the perturbative series. Okay. If this was a branch point, so that there's a cut along here, then the integral around the cut will also give you a non-perturbative term, multiply it by another perturbative series due to the cut, and then the interesting statement is that that new perturbative series is related to the original one. Okay, so that, those are words. The physics challenge is how much physics input and how much physics information can you use to actually make this work? So let me give you a few more examples now. Another way to state the idea is if you do perturbation theory, you have, in general, a formal asymptotic expansion. But Think, say, of the sign problem. So you've got a chemical potential. There's a problem when it's real. The problem goes away when it's imaginary. You can do the calculation on the lattice when it's imaginary. You can do the calculation perturbatively in mu. How do you put those things together when you analytically continue in this parameter? Is there a way to do that perturbative expansion in a way that's consistent with the expected analytic continuation properties of the parameter? And that's where we have to provide physics input. But we do have physics input because we have things like unitarity. We have things like causality. Okay? And those are very often useful to provide analytic conditions on things that we're calculating. So another definition of resurgence is that it's really global complex analysis, but with divergent formal, divergent series. And so in a very real sense, even though an asymptotic series is not the function, a trans series is the function. So let's see how this works. So the, the standard example is, let's go back to the ARI function. So I'm going to solve the ARI function two different ways, one using perturbation theory, one using path integrals. So this is the differential equation, area equation. So let's call perturbation theory, where I just make an ansatz for the, the function, plug it in, convert it to a recursion formula, and I calculate coefficients from the recursion formula. Okay? Let's call that perturbation theory. I'm just making a formal expansion. Well, you soon learn that the expansion parameter is not x, it's x to the three halves. That's sort of obvious. You just learn that right away. And then you learn that the series actually starts with an exponential. That's also sort of obvious. And then you start generating terms in the series, and you, you pretty soon discover the coefficients of these factorials. And the AI function has alternating, and the BI is non-alternating. Okay? There's an interesting factor of two here, which we'll come to. You see that these coefficients, there's an n factorial, an n factorial, and a 1 over n factorial, so the growth is n factorial. Okay? Not exactly n factorial, n factorial plus a sixth or something like that, n plus a sixth factorial. And there's a two-thirds to the n here that came out of the coefficients also. You'll notice that that's the same two-thirds up here, which is the same as the inverse of the three halves. It's not an accident. So if you just rotate if you just change the sign, get rid of the minus one to the n, it means you're changing the sign of x to the three halves, which means you're rotating x by e to the two pi over three. So if you just had this information, 
and you change the phase of x by 2 pi over 3, it looks like you just switch these two series. Okay? See that? But again, for the area functions, there's a non perturbative connection formula. As you rotate in the complex x plane by 2 pi over 3, you do in fact generate the other area function with some coefficient. But there's also the same area function comes back. Okay? And the issue is this is if x is, say, positive to start with, this is exponentially small compared to this. We didn't see it in the formal series, because the formal series is dealing just with power expansions. Okay? But it's still there, and it has to be there to have the correct analytic continuation properties of the area function. Okay? Again, how do, you how do you derive those analytic continuation properties? from the integral representation, which we'll do on the next slide. But the point is, this is not everything about the function because it doesn't tell you about that piece. But when I Borel sum this, I learn about that piece. That's the issue. So if I do the Borel sum of this, let me call just this part of the coefficient a n. It didn't fit on the slide otherwise. So since these are nice, nice, simple, closed formula for all the coefficients. I can calculate the Borel transform. Remember, the prescription is you divide by an extra n factorial and try to work out that sum. Well, that's, it's just a hypergeometric function. And so that's the, Borel, that's the exact Borel transform in this problem. Okay? So now we've just pushed the problem one step further. We now have to know what are the analytic continuation properties of the Borel transform, but the Borel transform is a hypergeometric function, and we know that the hypergeometric function has a branch cut going from plus one to plus infinity. Okay? So now, suppose I rotate x, that corresponds to changing the sine of x to the three halves, which I can interpret as changing the sine of t. I can just rotate the contour. When I rotate in T all the way around, I'll eventually hit that branch point, branch cut. Okay? But we know the, the dispersion relation. We know the jump across the branch cut of the hypergeometric function. So you can do that integral around the cut to find the difference between going that way and that way is the integral around that cut. And the, the imaginary part of the jump across that branch cut happens to be, again, the same hypergeometric function, just with the argument shifted by one, and that generates this extra term. Okay? So again, this is a special case because I know the exact Borel transform function, but the Borel transform function's analytic continuation properties tells me how to resum this series in such a way that is consistent with the analytic continuation properties of the function I was trying to find from a formal series to begin with. Okay. Is that clear? All right, so now let's solve this. And I'm, I'm going to call this perturbation theory because I did it starting from a formal series that was asymptotic. So now let's do it from the path integral point of view, which is a zero-dimensional path integral, just an ordinary integral. So this is the integral representation of the area function that I had on the first slide. So no chance of integrating that along the real t axis, simply impossible. So let's do a little bit of rescaling. So x is my parameter, external parameter, and I'm, I'm interested in x having magnitude that's large, but possibly changing the phase of x, from positive all the way to negative. So let me call x a magnitude times a, a phase factor. Then a little bit of rescaling, just rotate the t contour through pi over 2. So this is the wick rotation. And now I end up with this integral. So the large parameter is out front. This is the action. This is 1 over the coupling. And now this is my 
parameter, my chemical potential, whose phase I'm going to vary. And when I just make this change of variables, I've changed the contour of integration from along the real line to along the imaginary line. Okay? But in general, this integral can go along various contours. For it to be a valid contour, I need this thing to fall off at large distances, which means I need z cubed to be positive. Okay? Which means I can either end up here, here, or here. Those are the only three directions that I can end up that will give me a well-defined integral along these contours. Okay? So there are three possible contours. Only two of them are independent, but there are the three possible contours. Now, let's now look at the action. The saddle point of the action is just at z equals plus or minus i theta over 2. And when I evaluate the action on that saddle, I get the two-thirds out of the three halves, but with some phase factor, depending which angle the parameter x has. Okay? So this is how I would evaluate this for arbitrary phase of the parameter. Now let's, I warned you I was going to do it in gory detail, so let's just look at the case where x is positive. If x is real and positive, theta is zero. If theta is zero, then the saddles are at minus one and plus one. Okay? But I can just go through one saddle. Because I can, my contour, remember, was along the imaginary axis, I can just deform it into the gamma 1. Okay? So I pick up the contribution from just saddle. On that saddle, the action is negative. So that's why... That's why there's just this exponential decay when x is positive. One saddle only contributes. On the other hand, when x is negative, theta is plus or minus pi. Now there's a saddle point at plus i and minus i. Now remember, how do you do asymptotic evaluation of integrals like this? You deform the contours to go through the saddle points along steepest descent paths. Okay? So now I have to get from here to here and I have to go through those saddles, so the way to do it is to go in the other direction along gamma 3 and the other direction along gamma 2. And now you see you have a contribution from both saddles. When I evaluate the action on those saddles, it's i, plus or minus i, so that's why it's oscillating. There's an extra pi over 4 phase shift, remember it's not sine of two-thirds minus x to the three halves is that plus pi over four. That pi over four comes because you go through the steepest descent contour goes through the saddle at the angle pi over four. Okay. So that's how you solve for the behavior of the area function using the path integral, the integral representation. So we can see now that we get the same picture starting from Borel summation of the perturbative series, formal perturbative series, and the steepest descent analysis of the integral representation. So the whole idea is, can we do this in, an, in the infinite dimensional context, even in quantum mechanics or in field theory? So one more comment I want to make before we, we move on is that Notice that when theta is along any one of the blue lines here, when, so this is the x plane, not the t plane. When x is along one of these lines, these blue lines, that's the, those are the directions along which the action is real. If the action is real, there's a big difference between e to the plus action and e to the minus action. e to the minus action is negligible compared to e to the plus action. On the other hand, along the anti-Stokes lines, then the action is pure imaginary. And then now there's no difference in magnitude between e to the i action and e to the minus i action. So you have no reason whatsoever to neglect one compared to the other. So the whole problem here is that in the original asymptotic series, 
we dropped an exponentially small thing because along that expansion line, it was exponentially small. But when you rotate, at a certain point, it's not exponentially small anymore. So you have to somehow recover that information that you dropped at the beginning. Okay? And the idea of a trans series is that it keeps that information. Okay? Remember, it was an expansion in the perturbative series and the exponential. So this is the answer to your question. I wrote the exponential in a region where g squared was positive, but it's there all the time when g squared is changes phase. Okay, so another thing, so, so far, I think everything I've said you know, you may not have thought about it in comparison before, but here's something you know. Here's something you may not know. Let's look at the coefficients, the magnitude of the coefficients in the area function example. Remember, they're growing n factorial. So here are the first few numbers. You have a closed formula, so you can see how they behave as n goes to infinity. As n goes to infinity, indeed, they do grow like n factorial. There's a factor, I think it should actually be two-thirds, not two, sorry, it's a typo. The interesting thing is that the subleading corrections, so this is n minus one factorial with a factor one. This one is n minus two factorial. This is n minus three factorial, etc. The interesting thing is that the coefficients of these subleading corrections are the same numbers. Okay. So what's happening here is there are two saddle points, and each of them has a series multiplying an exponential. And in this simple case, the coefficients in the two exponential series are just alternating sign different from one another. But they have another relation, which is that the large order behavior of these guys are prescribed by the low numbers on this side. And since they're just the same thing, you get the same numbers coming back. And so this behavior is completely generic. Any problem you give me, I can guarantee you this happens. So this is one example of this picture that I drew before. So the fluctuations around this series, around this point here, the singular point or the saddle point, the large order behavior of these coefficients are encoded in the low order behavior of coefficients around neighboring saddles. I'm that more precise in the second lecture. Okay? But this is a completely generic phenomenon, quite surprising. If you don't believe me, pick your random special function, look it up in a book, look up the series, check this, it's amazing. All right, now one more example. Another interesting asymptotic series, the Stirling series for gamma function. So let's not talk about the gamma function, let's talk about the log of the gamma function because now I'm talking about a series, not a product. And let's take a derivative just to make things a little bit easier. So here's the asymptotic series you can look up for psi of one plus z at large positive z. Right? So this is the definition of this digamma function. All right, so you'll, if you just stop here, you might think this looks like a nice convergent series, but uh, they grow, the coefficients, in fact, grow very fast, 2n factorial. Now, that's just a formal series which you can generate from the uh, functional relation here. So the, psi, the gamma function satisfies two basic properties. One is that x gamma of x is gamma of x plus 1, which translates into this functional relation. And you can check that this formula is consistent with that. But we know another thing about the gamma function. We know its analytic continuation. We know the reflection formula that relates gamma of x and gamma of 1 minus x. And if I translate that into the psi function, this is the reflection formula. And the point is, this series is not consistent with this formula. So to see that, let's take this series and look along the imaginary line, where z is iy, 
So you look at this series. Well, this is going to produce an, Im an imaginary part. This will produce an imaginary part. Everything else is a function of z squared. Every other term in the series is z squared. So that has no imaginary part. So if you just took this series and you asked, what's the imaginary part of psi of 1 plus i y, you would write down these two terms from here and here. Here and here. OK? The point is, there's an infinite set of exponentials coming from here, which you missed. Okay. You missed by just naively looking at this thing, replacing z by iy. So the formal series just has these two perturbative terms and no, none of these non-perturbative terms. So now you can recover these non-perturbative terms in two ways. You can take this series and you can put it through this Borel process. Write down the Borel transform, write down the integral, and check what happens when you now analytically continue with the analytic properties of the Borel transform. Or you can just take the original series and ask, what do I need to add to the original series to make it consistent with this? And you, of course, get the same answer. Okay. So this is a fairly dramatic example because it shows you that the, just the bare asymptotic series is inconsistent with the analytic information of the function. And moreover, you can recover it by imposing consistency with some analyticity property, or equivalently, you can recover it from the Borel summation process. So this is, what, this is, I think, the simplest example I can think of of what we might call a non-perturbative completion where from the perturbative information, we somehow reconstruct non-perturbative information. There are several interesting lessons here. One is that the number of exponentials that appear is equal to the order of the differential equation that it satisfies, if you're lucky enough to be calculating something that satisfies a differential equation. So remember, the airy function satisfies a second-order equation. So there are two exponentials. This is just basic WKB, e to the plus or minus the WKB integral. The gamma function satisfies an infinite order differential equation because gamma of 1 plus x is e to the d by dx acting on gamma of x. It satisfies an infinite order differential equation. There should be an infinite number of exponential terms. Moreover, these exponential terms are kind of boring because they're not multiplied by a series. If you think of these as instantons, they're instantons with no fluctuations around them. And that's because the Borel transform function is meromorphic. It only has poles, not branch cuts. So the asymptotic series come from branch points, not from poles. So you might think this is kind of trivial and kind of boring, but actually this example shows up in lots of places. Exactly this integral. In Euler-Heisenberg effective field theory, finite temperature field theory, field theory in the sitter space, exact S matrices, chern simons et cetera, et cetera. It shows up all over the place. All right, so I'll just recap that, that the, an nth order linear ODE has n non-perturbative terms. When you go to a nonlinear differential equation, you are guaranteed to have an infinite number of exponentials. And I'll walk you through an example in a second. Just a simple thing, if you take two solutions, two independent solutions of a second order equation, you multiply them, you know that that thing satisfies a third order equation. But if you divide them, it satisfies a nonlinear equation. And if you divide two things, each of which has two exponentials, you expand the exponentials, you have an infinite number of exponentials. Okay? So nonlinear equations will almost always, in fact, I think always, have an infinite number of exponential contributions. And that is what we should expect when we come to field theory or quantum mechanics. So there's a special class of functions called Penlevé functions which are sort of the nonlinear analogs of all the special functions that we know from you know, Bessel and Legendre and Laguerre, et cetera, et cetera. And these keep showing up everywhere in physics for some somewhat mysterious reason. 
And these now have been studied in great detail, and their resurgence properties are very well understood. So I'm going to walk you through one example to show you what can happen, what new things can happen when you go to a nonlinear system compared to a linear system. And this is not a randomly chosen example. This shows up in many, many places in physics. This is the so-called Penleve 2 equation. By the way, the notation here is Penleve was asking the question, can you classify differential nonlinear differential equations which are second order but are nonlinear in the function and have this special property that the singularities that depend on initial conditions are only poles, not branch cuts or, or um, essential singularities. And there's an answer to that question, believe it or not. There are six equations that have that property that cannot be solved by element, other elementary means, and these are called Penave 1 through 6. And all of them show up all over the place in physics. It's really quite remarkable. So Penleve 2 is 1. This is the equation. This is the nonlinear term. It shows up in random matrices, the so-called tracy Widom law. This is universal law for the statistics of maximum eigenvalues. It shows up in correlators in all sorts of statistical mechanics models. It's the double scaling limit in various matrix models. It's related to Brownian motion, non-intersecting Brownian motion. It has even purely mathematical applications in combinatorics, and I could have gone on for several more pages in the list of its applications. So let's look at how we would process this. So let's look at the x goes to plus infinity. And let's suppose we're looking for a solution that's decaying at plus infinity. If it's becoming small, then I can neglect y cubed compared to the other terms. Okay? So my leading approximation will be when I neglect this term and I just have now a linear equation whose solution is the area function. Okay? But it's a linear equation, so it's the area function multiplied by any constant. So I'll call that constant sigma, and I'll call it a plus because I'm talking about x in the plus direction. Okay, so this is the leading approximation under the condition that I want this to decay fast at plus infinity. Okay, so we know, we just did, that this thing has itself the behavior of e to the minus two-thirds x to the three-halves times an infinite series. Okay, so what that means in practice is that I can now take this, plug this, put a, say, a delta here for that plus something, I can plug that into this, expand, and I get an equation now for the delta, the extra piece that I left off. The linear equation is guaranteed to be solved, just because that's the solution, but I'll get now an inhomogeneous equation for delta. And then I can continue. I can just continue this process. And you generate immediately a trans series. You generate odd powers of area functions, odd powers because it's y cubed, and each of those area functions has its leading asymptotics being like this, multiplied by a series. But once you have one of these exponentials, and because of this cube, you generate all the odd powers. So the solution, and remember this parameter here was arbitrary at the linear order, the interesting thing is, at the next order, you don't get a new, sol new parameter, okay? because it's an inhomogeneous equation. So there's no new parameter there. And what happens is you just get a trans series, which is a sum of exponentials, each of which is multiplied by an asymptotic series. Okay? So it's, it's not, there are no logarithms here, this is not a full-blown trans series, but it's a series in exponentials, each of which is multiplied by a divergent asymptotic series. So think of this as an instanton expansion, each of which has fluctuations around the k instanton sector, but only odd instantons show up in here because of this property of the, of the equation. So there's an infinite number of non-perturbative terms. I can look at 
the behavior of the coefficients of each of these asymptotic series. For each k, I can do that. And you learn, amazingly, that for different k's, the fluctuation coefficients are related in a very precise way. Okay, a few more minutes. This so-called tra trans-series parameter, this parameter sigma plus here, it's an initial condition parameter. It's a boundary condition parameter. Remember, this is a second-order equation. I just said I wanted something to decay in one direction. That's not enough. That's one condition. There's another condition. And interestingly, these series are factorially divergent and alternating in sign, which means that when I do this Borel summation problem uh, trick, I don't have any of these poles along the positive x-axis, okay? Everything's real and summable. That means that if I ask for a real solution to this equation, then sigma plus is just a real parameter. It doesn't need an imaginary part to do any cancellations. And it's at this point completely undetermined. And as I said, there are these large order, low order relations in the coefficients. Now let's look at the other direction. As x goes to minus infinity, I'm now going to declare that I want a solution that is smooth, non-oscillating, which means I choose for this to be small compared to these. Right? This is my choice. I want to look for a solution that in the minus x direction, the derivatives are small. So then I balance this against this, so the leading behavior is just minus root minus x over 2. And then I can develop corrections, and I learn that I have a series of corrections in powers of minus x to the 3 halves. And no big surprise, that turns out to be a divergent series. And now you can now really extend that because it's a divergent series, so it produces exponential terms. So I'm, I can add to this formal zeroth order series an exponential term times a new series, plug it in, I'll get a recursion formula for the coefficients of the new series in terms of the coefficients of the first series. And because it's a nonlinear equation, that will just continue to all powers. Notice it's all powers, not all odd powers on this side. And these guys are actually divergent and non-alternating which means that this trans-series parameter has to be imaginary if I want a real solution, because I have to cancel the imaginary exponentials that are generated by the Borel summation. Okay, so now let's try and put these two things together. I've, I've looked at minus x and plus x, and now let's try to tie them together. So I want a solution that's decaying like this at plus x and going like along this parabola at minus x. Now we see some of the interesting things that happen in nonlinear systems. First of all, I derived a trans-series on this side and on this side, and if you were watching carefully, this looks very much like the Airy function, because it came from the Airy function. And you might have thought there's a typo here. This sort of looks like the Airy function but it's not a typo. Actually, the exponentials on this side and this side are completely different. Okay. What's happening, this is an instanton resummation trick, that as you approach x equals zero, these things, which at large positive x were exponentially small, as you approach x equals zero, you need all of the exponentials, not just leading exponential. So you need all of the instantons. You go through a phase transition, and it comes out the other side of the phase transition as new instantons, or actually complex instantons, with a different phase factor. Phase factor, different coefficient in the exponent. This is an all-orders resummation of instantons across a phase transition. And I'll show you in the third lecture how this works in some real physics models. So there's a so-called Hastings-McLeod solution which is the unique solution which starts like an airy function and ends up as the, on the parameter. And it only works if you choose this coefficient out here to be 1. 
you choose it slightly bigger than one, it will diverge. If you choose it slightly less than one, it will oscillate eventually. Okay? So again, this is another side of the coin, is that when you're dealing with these nonlinear systems, there's often extreme sensitivity to boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are the encoding in the trans series of the so-called trans series parameters. They encode boundary conditions. You can have in nonlinear systems extreme sensitivity to boundary conditions, and that shows up in when you match between two different regions, you have to choose these trans series coefficients, trans series parameters, precisely in order to match smoothly. So there's a known connection formula for any value of this sigma plus, but at exactly at sigma plus equals one, you can join smoothly from this region to this region. And this is an example of condensation of instantons across a phase transition. And this is exactly what happens at the phase transition in various um, matrix models. Okay. All right, so I think I should probably stop there and we'll continue this afternoon. Thanks. Well, uh, questions? You, you have stressed the importance of the airy functions. I would like to give a comment at the importance of the airy function from totally different point of view. Yeah. We have been looking at the exact lattice supersymmetry formulation uh, as a new type of formulation for lattice theory. And uh, we found out lattice formulation, which is equivalent to the continuum theory. In order to define this uh, equivalence, we need to introduce inverse Goodermannian function, which is essentially log of the sine function. And then this uh, newly defined uh, lattice formulation is non-local. However, it is equivalent to the continuum theory. And in order to define this non-locality, we, we need to introduce a new type of product which we call it as some star product. And then there, there is a kernel function coming in there. And then this kernel function is essentially this airy function. Because uh, uh, two product going into the one web, it's, it's a wave function from lattice to continuum. And two product of the web, lattice wave function going into one function through this kernel and that's essentially this uh, airy function. And the airy function plays a role of the delta function because if you multiply the, some function there, it, uh, this uh, zero part dominate, mm -hmm. right? And then the large n parameter in this case is one over lattice, lattice constant. So that lattice constant goes to zero, uh, large, it becomes essentially large n, then that function plays the role of the delta, delta function. So it's, uh, I would say that this is another example. Okay. Yep. Thank you. That, that sounds to me like something, the airy transform, which is widely used in optics, or I think something that sounds like the same, same idea. So let's discuss later. I mean, another reason the airy function is somewhat universal is if you think to WKB, the sort of way we unfortunately teach our students to do WKB is that you go through a turning point, but of course the normal WKB doesn't work at a turning point. So the real story that we should be telling our students is that you go through a turning point uniformly using exactly the area function. So the generic behavior through a turning point is the area function, and then there's no problem at turning points, and that's called uniform WKB. And in fact, this example here is the nonlinear version of that. And that's why this N of A2 equation, I think, is so universal. It's the nonlinear, it's the infinite version of turning points, so semi-classical turning points. 
Undoubtedly, these things are all related somehow. More questions? Uh, in your introductory slides, when you mentioned that uh, a set of functions which has this perturbative part plus uh, the instanton part and also the multi instanton part, they are closed under uh, different operations. But in these examples, we never get the multi instanton part. So, does it affect? Uh, what do you mean we never get the multi instanton? Oh, okay. okay. All, all powers of instantons. Okay. What I, what I was saying here is that in order to match smoothly, you really need all of them. And moreover, to go through that transition, you have to resum all of them. Okay. Is, you know, to change this into this, you need to do a resummation of all instanton factors. So at the beginning, you mentioned a rather large zoo of functions that enter the general resurgence expansion, including exponentials of exponentials and logs and logs. Do they all start appearing when you look at functions that have both branch cuts and poles? Or what, what does it take to start seeing all of these more complicated functions? So, so suppose you start from a differential equation. So this is, from a physics point of view, maybe not the most interesting thing, but because we can all understand it. So, the usual differential equation, we're used to you know, the coefficients in the differential equation are some sort of meromorphic functions, right? They're powers and maybe there are some poles or something like that. So that's guaranteed by theorems that you will just generate one exponential. Okay? But if the coefficients in your differential equation involved e to the minus 1 over x, then you will generate an exponential of an exponential in the solution and so on. So that's a partial answer, but not a very useful one. So in order to generate them from a differential equation, you need to have a trans-series type structure in the differential equation itself, not just powers. Okay? So you saw that when you go to nonlinear equations, you'll generate all powers of a given exponential. So that's one more step going to nonlinear equations. To generate logarithms, you seem to need to go to at least path integrals or, say, high order Feynman diagrams. Uh, there are these old results of people like Weinberg who are looking at the, an arbitrary Feynman diagram with some external mass, some external momenta and some masses, and you look at the behavior of that diagram when the masses become large or the external momenta become large. And that generically gives you a series in powers of the momenta and masses and logarithms, but also logarithms of logarithms of logarithms are generated by those sorts of questions. Um, resummations in field theory, resum resumming you know, rainbow diagrams or certain classes of diagrams, those can generate powers of logarithms, again, in external momentors and masses. If you sum Another class of diagrams, you can generate repeated logarithms. Now, um, exponentials of exponentials are a little bit more interesting from the field theory point of view. Um, if you look at fluctuations around a classical solution, so a classical solution is a solution to a nonlinear equation, right? Instanton is a solution to some nonlinear equation. So it will have in it possibly some non perturbative exponential. If you now look at fluctuations around it, you're now looking at a differential equation that has exponentials in it. So the solution to the fluctuation problem around a saddle point in a field theory will generically produce exponentials of exponentials. Okay? But just one, or one level. They call it level, the level of exponential. I don't know of a simple non-artificial problem that generates exponential, exponential, a whole series of them. 
You can always write down a differential equation just by writing down the function and differentiating it. But so this coefficient functions of this differential equation, let's say some linear differential equation of nth order. These coefficient functions can have different poles, and then you can probably do this perturbation analysis around different points. When you say that um, that series will have uh, n non perturbative contributions, uh, are you uh, like around which point? It's the order of the equation, not the number of points, not the number of poles. Yes, so uh, let's say the order of the equation is n. Okay, let's talk about this later. This is kind of technical. So there is an answer though. Okay. I think we need a blackboard or a 